In theory, programming a PLC to turn on a motor contactor is easy. If a button's pressed, then engage the contactor's coil. Of course, during the hardware video, we saw that in most systems, there really is a lot more to it. Here's our ladder code wish list. We want a circuit breaker status indicator. We want to be able to trip the circuit breaker on a button press. We want an overload indicator. And on the forward button press, we want to start the motor in the forward direction if the motor is not coasting, if the stop button is not being pressed, if the reverse contactor isn't engaged, if the circuit breaker is on, if the overload is not tripped, and we'll want the forward indicator lit while the motor is running. The reverse button has the exact same requirements, except it doesn't start the motor if the forward contactor is engaged. We want the stop indicator to flash when the motor is coasting and to be on when the motor is stopped. I've already allocated some memory addresses and entered all the tag names to save us some time. You may notice there aren't any physical button inputs. That's because we're using a Seymour HMI to control this system. So instead of looking at PLC inputs, we'll be using these memory addresses that are being updated when the user presses the virtual buttons on the Seymour screen. OK, let's do it. Let's get the motor running in the forward direction. So on a button press, our virtual Seymour HMI button in this example, enable the forward contactor, which is output Y1 in our setup. And once that forward contactor is engaged, the aux contact closes so we can use that to keep the motor running even after the momentary forward button is released. We call this sealing or latching the contact. Now I should mention that we'll be using a lot of shortcuts to expedite the typing of this code. So if something appears on a rung and you're not sure how it got there, then check out Do More Designer Help Topic number 220. It has everything you need to know about editing ladder code. We need a way to stop the motor, so we'll add a stop button. Stop buttons are normally closed, so this is active all the time until you press a stop button, which opens this contact, which releases the contactor, which releases the aux contact, and breaks the seal or latching action of this circuit. We only want the motor to be started if the motor is not coasting. We'll create that in just a minute. And we want to make sure that the reverse contactor is not engaged. We don't want to run the motor if the overload is tripped. And finally, we don't want the motor to be enabled if there is no power. This serves as a handy reminder to check the power, of course, but more importantly, it makes sure the motor can't be latched or sealed in while the power is off. If we didn't check the circuit breaker status, then there's nothing to prevent this ladder code from energizing the contactor, which enables the aux contact and latches or seals in the circuit. So when the power is applied, the motor will already be enabled and it will jump to life. Normally, we don't want that to happen. So adding this contact to prevent the circuit from latching while the power is off is a really important safety feature. And we'll add a comment for that wrong. The reverse motor circuit is exactly the same, except it uses the reverse virtual button to start things. It doesn't run if the forward contact is engaged and latches on the reverse aux contact. And let's update that comment too. We need a five second timer for the motor spin down. So we'll watch both contactors aux contacts and if either one of these gets released, we'll start an off timer. An off timer starts a timer after the input has been released. During that time, we'll set a bit called motor coasting. Now we can use that motor coasting bit to create the flashing stop indicator. If the reverse and the forward contactor are not active, but the motor is coasting, we'll set a bit to indicate that the motor is still active. If we add the system 100 millisecond bit here, it'll make the light flash. This will drive the stop button indicator, which is just the inverted version of this motor active bit. We also want to turn on the motor active bit if either contactor is active. Again, this will turn off the stop button indicator. Finally, we need for the circuit breaker shunt trip button to trip the breaker, which is at Y0. And let's add some comments for all these wrongs. It's important to understand that with the addition of this code, we're now protecting our control system with triple redundancy. We prevent the motor from running in one direction. If it's already running in the other direction, we have fail safes here in the code, here in the wiring, and mechanically with an interlock block. That creates a super reliable, fault tolerant system. Changing all of this over to a system that uses mechanical buttons instead of the virtual Seymour HMI buttons we used here is easy. Let's assume the start button comes in on X4, reverse on X5, and stop on X6. Well, then you just replace these with X4, these with X5, 
and these with X6. Now, don't forget to make sure that the forward and reverse buttons are momentary normally open buttons and that the stop button is a momentary normally closed button. Well, let's try it. Accept everything, save our work, and transfer the project to the PLC. If we turn on status monitoring, then these blue highlights mean the contacts are active. When all the contacts between the left and the right side are lit, the power is flowing to the output coil. So this tells us that the forward button is not being pressed, the motor's not coasting, the normally closed stop button hasn't broken the circuit, the reverse contact is not active, and the power and the overload are good to go. If we press the overload test button, we see that go inactive, and if we flip the motor circuit breaker off, we see its aux contact open up. Great, looks like things are working. So, when we press the forward button, we now have all the contacts on this rung active and power flows to the output coil and starts the motor spinning. Once the contactor engages, its aux contact will also engage, which is this contact right here. So when we release the momentary forward button, this aux contact will keep the motor running. We call that sealing or latching the circuit. Pressing the stop button will open this contact and disable the contactor, which kills power to the motor. It also starts the 5 second timer for the flashing stop button, which was off screen when we did it, so let's start the motor again and scroll down to the timer section of the code. This time, when we press the stop button, we should see this off delay timer count down for 5 seconds, which will turn this motor coasting bit on, and this aux contact will go inactive, which will light up this contact. Then, every time the system 100 millisecond bit is active, the motor active bit will turn on. The stop button indicator light is just the inverse of this motor active bit, so if the motor is not active, the stop button will be lit. Of course, if either contactor is inactive, then the motor will also be inactive, which again will light the stop indicator. Let's try it. When we press the stop button, the timer counts down, the motor coasting bit goes active, the aux contact releases, and sure enough, the stop button indicator flashes. Perfect. Let's start the reverse direction, which works exactly the same as the forward circuit, but this time we'll press the overload test button, and sure enough, it deactivates this contact, which disables the contactor and his aux contact, which kills the power to the motor. Exactly what we expected. The circuit breaker aux contact would work the same way. Finally, let's make sure the shunt trip kills the branch circuit breaker and shuts down the motor. Start the motor in the forward direction, hit the shunt trip, and no surprise here. When we kill the power to the motor, it stops. More importantly, this also breaks the sealing action of the ladder code so when the power is reapplied, the motor won't jump back to life and surprise someone. That would be an accident waiting to happen. Well, this all looks great, but there is a potential problem. What happens if the user presses both the forward and reverse buttons at exactly the same time, or even just real close to the same time? Well, the power will flow through all these contacts on both the forward and reverse rungs because their respective aux contacts won't have closed yet. It can take an aux contact 10 or 20 milliseconds to close, which means we won't see that feedback until many scans later, which means both of these outputs will fire, which will engage both contactors, which will short out the power mains. And that's a bad thing, right? Well, not really, because it physically can't happen in this system. Remember, in the hardware video, we installed a mechanical interlock to prevent just this scenario. It physically won't allow two contactors to engage at the same time. Because of that, one of the aux contacts can't close, so that circuit will never seal or latch. Let's prove it. Let's engage both contactors on the same forward button press. Now they're guaranteed to start at exactly the same time. Let's accept that change and write it out to the PLC. Sure enough, if we press the forward button, both circuits light up, but then the reverse circuit turns back off because the mechanical interlock wouldn't allow the reverse aux contact to close. So now you see why it was so important to add that extra mechanical interlock in the hardware video. And since it's just snapped into place and it's only $2.50, why wouldn't you add the extra insurance to make sure you have an idiot-proof, super reliable system. One side note, you could add another contact here that says don't reverse the motor if the forward contactor is active, and the opposite here. But since the mechanical interlock already has it covered, 
We didn't add that in this example. But if you don't have access to a mechanical interlock, this is the next best thing. And as always, if you have any questions or need any help, please don't hesitate to contact AutomationDirect's free, award-winning tech support. They'll be happy to help you. And don't forget the forums. There are lots of folks there that love to share their years of experience. Just don't post any support questions there. Tech support doesn't monitor the forums on a regular basis.